Uh, if you, at this time, if you've got a bulletin, you can go ahead and get that out. You can start uh, following along with the message that way. Or if you're technologically advanced, like I am, and you prefer not to write on paper because that's caveman error stuff, I'm just kidding. I prefer to write on paper sometimes. But we also have our Bible app. So if you want to pull up the Bible app on your phone, your version Bible app, you can go there. Go to the events section, search for Reclamation Church, and we should be there for you. You can pull up today's outline and you can follow along that way. Our theme verse for this series, our Race to Life series, is coming out of John 10. 10. We have two theme verses for the series. John 10.10 10 states, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come that you may have life and have it abundantly, or life in all of its fullness. And John 11.25 says, I am the resurrection and the life, that being Jesus. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. So I just want to give a quick recap of, of the, the vision of this, of this series, this Raised to Life series. And we are, we are basically, we are discovering what life is in Jesus Christ. We are discovering the new life that he gives us in his, in his blood and in his, in his resurrection and, and what he does for us. And we are visiting three specific stories, three specific resurrections in the New Testament where Jesus himself raised the dead. And last week we looked at, if you, you'll probably notice that we're going on a progression here. Last week we looked at Jairus's daughter who was uh, asleep. She was 12 years old and, and she had fallen asleep from what Jesus said, but everybody was, she, she had died and, and everybody was just, just in agony over the death of this 12 year old girl. And Jesus shows up and he says, don't worry. She's not dead. She's only asleep. And so last week we talked about the importance of having that wake up call. We, we identified what it is to be a sleepy Christian and, and to confront the daily struggle of hitting snooze on God. And because honestly, let's be honest, that's, that's a str struggle that we face every day. We, we want to do what we want to do. And God calls out to us and we say, hang on, God, I'm, I'm still working on what I'm doing right here. So we, we had a wake up call last week. Jesus came in and he, he woke us up and we're not sleepy Christians anymore. And we love the, what Lisa Bevere said. She said, we are most dangerous to the enemy when we are fully awake to God. Fully awake to God. And fully awake means we are aware. We are knowing of what God is doing in our life and what God is doing in and around us. And that means that we also put away distractions. We recall the story of Mark chapter 5 where Jairus' daughter was dead and Jesus came in and, and he said that there was this loud commotion. The verses, the scripture said there was this loud commotion and weeping and wailing and, and Jesus said, get out. He, he, he lets us know that we've got to get rid of all of these commotions in our life, all of these distractions in our life. And because these distractions cause spiritual ADD and they're always fighting for our attention. And if we're not careful, it puts us on all these rabbit trails. And we all know the, the, the annoyance of rabbit trails when you're in a meeting and we divert on all these paths and we, we continually move and move and move, but we go nowhere. We have to fight spiritual ADD so we don't end up on the rabbit trail. It reminded me of Alice in Wonderland. She finds herself always chasing the rabbit and she ends up getting herself lost in Wonderland. And how many of us are lost in this world because we're always chasing the rabbit. We're always chasing the distractions in life. But if you don't know where you're going, even distractions look like opportunities. So we have to be careful to guard what is coming against us and guard against those things that are fighting for our attention and say, no, I need to focus on Jesus. I need to focus on where he's bringing me because that was the old me. I don't, have, I don't do that anymore. Those opportunities, are not, they're not opportunities. Those are consequences. We need to focus on the opportunity of Jesus Christ only. And so when we know where we're going, then we know the way. And I'm reminded that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way finds a way to help us if we're not careful. The way will find a way to help us. And, and I love it because it becomes an interruption 
in our life. Have you ever been watching your favoriteest TV show of all time? It's probably like one of those high-strung dramas where they always leave on cliffhangers, right? And you're like, oh, and now you have to binge watch the entire series on Netflix because each, each episode ends in one of those cliffhangers. You're like, oh, I got to keep watching. Or you're watching your favorite comedian and right as the punchline is about to happen, right as they're about to drop the, the, drop the punchline, boom. Breaking news, we interrupt your broadcasting for this special report. And you're like, no! Have you ever been there? I've been there. And it's more annoying when it's not really news. Really? You could have just put this out on the internet and probably got more following. When you're, you, I, I missed the whole punchline. And if you're watching live TV, that's it. You don't see it until it comes out on Netflix. Right? You've missed the whole thing. And you try to watch the recap, but it's not the same. Because it's in the moment. Right? And, and we hate it when it happens. And that's the, that's the thing that I want to show to you that we, we are living this life and we are so invested in this life. And, it, and right at the right moment, an interruption happens. And I say that because our lives that we're invested in have all of these plans that we make, all of these dreams that we make, all of these distractions that we see as opportunities that we begin to chase after. And we can feel the intensity building in our life and, and something's just not right. And I'm doing what I want to do. I'm doing the plan that I wanted to do, but I just feel empty in life. I just feel nothing. And it's getting critical and critical and critical. And we almost feel like just giving up, but right at the right moment, Jesus says, Breaking news. I interrupt your regular scheduled life to bring you some good news. Isn't that awesome? So I want to I want to encourage you today and talk about the interruption of who Jesus is because he finds a way to interrupt us at the right moment in our life. So let me tell you, and once we can identify and, and agree on what interruptions are, this will begin to open your mind and understand the importance of the interruption of Jesus. I call it the Jesus interruption in your life. So let's understand what interruptions are and what, and what they do. Interruptions for the first thing, stop us from doing what we want to do, right? Maybe, maybe parents, you're sitting at home and you're just, you want to do nothing, but lay on the couch and you're resting and relaxing. And then your kid comes running in on the forehead. Mom, mom, dad, dad. Well, I was relaxing. I was doing what I wanted to do. And when we are doing what we wanted to do, we forsake everything around us and we become more about ourselves and what we want to do. We even get to the point where we're like, okay, I want no interruptions in life. I'm going to my room and shutting the door. Nobody come in. I've been there. Any other parents been there? I am shutting the door. I'm locking everybody out. This is about me. I need me time. So we have to understand that Jesus interruption stops us from doing what we want to do. And he shows us what he wants to do in our life. No one likes interruptions. We all have plans. We all have a list of things that we want to do, but an interruption stops us from doing those things. And we, here's the biggest thing. We dislike interruptions because it reminds us that we're not in control. And we fight for control over our life every single day. We, we, we talked about it last week, how we want to take over the wheel of our life and we want to drive and do what we want to do. And if we're not careful, the distractions lull us to sleep. And if we fall asleep at the wheel of our life, it is disastrous. It reminds us that we are not in control. These things happen to us every day. Interruptions happen every day. But here's the thing, it happens to us spiritually too. When Jesus gets a hold of us and says, hang on, I've got something greater for you. I know your plans that you have for you, but the plans I have for you are even greater, wilder, more amazing than you can ever ask or think. So when we see opportunities that are, or when we see interruptions that are not just obstacles to our plan, we learn that, that they become opportunities for us to embrace God's plan. Interruptions, uh, Jesus' interruption is not just an obstacle to our plan. It's an opportunity for us to embrace his plan in our life. Amen? The interruption 
of Jesus. So let's talk about what, what my plan looks like. What does my plan look like? We all have plans in our life, but here's the thing. Our plans always leave us feeling empty. Have you ever been there? You, you do what you love to do and you feel so passionate about it, but after a while you just grow kind of like, eh. I, I mean, I was having fun doing this. It was good, but now I just feel so empty. And it's because we, we d decide to pour all of these things of this world into us. And, and it turns out none of those things can satisfy us. Only Jesus can. And so we try to fill the void. We try to fill the emptiness of, of our life and the emptiness of our heart. But only God can fill it. So we feel empty over time. And, and it, we become empty. And emptiness is another thing of misery. It leads to misery. And you know what they say about misery? It loves company. So we begin to surround ourselves with like-minded people who are also miserable. And we try to get encouragement from them that ultimately is just discouragement from them because misery loves company and misery is just surrounding us. And all of the decisions and plans that we make, we put people around us to puff us up and make us feel good about it. And, and, but really, in reality... If we are searching for approval from man, we're not going anywhere. We have to find our approval in Jesus Christ. We often feel empty. And we'll see here in a minute that those kinds of feelings and those kind of emotions begin to attract a sizable crowd around us. And we'll dive in here in just a minute with, with what that means. But another thing is we also feel broken. We also, we not just feel empty, we feel broken inside. God, I don't understand. I'm doing what I wanted to do. I, I'm doing what I thought you called me to do, but I feel like everything is just broken around me. And it's, and it's almost like a broken record. Have you ever listened to a broken record? You put it on the, what are they called? The record player? The turn, turntable. I learned something new today. You, you put the record on the turntable, on the record player, Right? And it's broken, so it just keeps going, and it hits the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And you think, hmm, well, if I just pick up the needle and move it. So we pick up the needle and we move it, and it keeps getting to that spot. And, and we think that if we can just pick up and move part of our life somewhere, that it'll be different. But our life is broken without Jesus Christ. And so it becomes like a broken record in our life. We end up repeating the same things over and over again. And we try to do something different about it, but it always leads to the same end. And what's the definition of insanity? doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And so we end up living this insane life. There's insanity all around us and life is broken. But I want to remind you that there is a peace speaker. We discovered him during the Christmas series, the gifts of Christmas, and he brought peace. And peace is not just the absence of a storm and not just the absence of war, the absence of conflict. Peace is the completeness, the wholeness of God. When he speaks peace, he brings completeness into our life. And where things are broken, he puts it back together and he fills those empty pieces in our life. And remember, he comes to give life in its fullness. He fills us up where we were empty. Another aspect of our own plan is it often and always leads to the wrong direction. Off with always lead in the wrong direction. And Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way which seems right to a man, but in the end, it's just the way of death. Proverbs 14, 12. We, we think we have it all figured out. We think we've got the plan down packed, but in the end, if it's our plan that we're following, it just leads to death. And, and if we could just get on the plan of the way, it leads to life. Amen? Life in Jesus Christ. So I want to ask you to stand, and we're going to uh, look at Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, verse 11 to 16. We're going to look at the Jesus interruption. Luke 7, 11 to 16. If you don't have it, we have a, a, we'll have it up on the board behind me, up on the wall behind me. If you have it, say amen. If you don't, say hold on. Verse 11, it says, soon afterwards, he went to a city called Nain, or Nine. 
and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. And fear gripped them all and began to glorify God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us and God has visited his people. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, the encouragement of life in you. And today, Lord, I pray that we would open our eyes and our ears to see and hear your word today, God. Open our hearts to, to adopt your word and, and to put your word into action today. Lord, reveal yourself to us in a way that we have never seen before. Reveal your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated at this time. I want to talk about three characteristics of a Jesus interruption. Three characteristics of a Jesus interruption. And the first is his interruptions are intentional. His interruptions are completely deliberate and intentional. There is purpose behind a Jesus interruption in your life. If we could go back to the beginning of this chapter, he was first in Capernaum where he healed a centurion servant. And he now, in verse 11, is on his way to Nain. And if you were to look at a map, this place is about 25 miles away from Capernaum. It's a tiny, itty-bitty town, smaller than Spring Lake, and there's not much to it. Yet Jesus was deliberate and intentional about getting to this place. His interruptions are completely intentional. And he is intentional about getting to you. We see this tons of times throughout Scripture, throughout the Gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus is intentional about getting to people. No matter how insignificant they may seem or they may feel. And I want to encourage you today, you may feel like nothing. You may feel completely empty and void and you may feel completely insignificant, but he is intentional on getting to you. Amen? And he is intentional on bringing you life, bringing you good news, bringing you something better. You are not so insignificant that he would pass you up. In verse 13, he looks at the mother this widow who has now lost everything. She's, she's, she's lost everything. She's lost her husband before. And now she's lost her only son, her only child, and she's got nothing. She has no bright future ahead of her whatsoever. And I love it because the intentionality of Jesus goes beyond words. He tells her, don't weep, don't cry. But he goes beyond that. He reaches out and does something amazing in her life by bringing her son back to life. He is intentional in his interruptions. He gave her a reason to stop crying. He didn't just tell her to stop crying. And I love this part. It says that Jesus touched the coffin. Before he did anything, he told her, don't cry. And before anything happened after that, he reached out and touched the coffin. And immediately the procession stopped. How awesome is that? Can you imagine if you see a funeral procession? We've seen funeral processions down the road, right? Driving down the road. Can you imagine if somebody just randomly got out in the middle of the road and said, stop? It, <laughs> that's pretty insane and pretty intense. But that's exactly what Jesus did. He saw a funeral procession and he said, hold on. There's something beautiful about to happen. And he says, don't cry, but watch this. And he reaches out and he touches the coffin where the young man laid. And immediately something beautiful happened. He raised to life. But here's the thing. People weren't expecting that interruption. I imagine the pallbearers were like, hey, we're, we're, we've got a job to do. We're going to do the job. We're going to get him to the gravesite, uh, And hopefully this lady will be okay. There, there's this interruption that happens. And so, and it's kind of like what we do when we find our secret place. 
when we find our place of solitude, remember I just talked about how we go to the room and we lock the door and we don't be shut in by ourselves and it almost becomes our coffin. We shut off ourselves to the world. We shut off ourselves to our children. And I'm not just talking about a room. I'm talking about spiritually. We shut ourselves, to, shut ourselves off to anybody and everybody. And we become encaged in our fortress of solitude. And we shut ourselves up in our places. And we put these barriers up so nobody can enter in. We put these walls up so nobody can, can speak to us and access us. And we say, this is it. This is who I am. Nobody bother me. I need to live my life. So we put up these rules. It says, you can't talk to me. And we put up these walls that prevent people from entering. And it's almost like what happens here because Mosaic law says that you can't touch anything dead. And Jesus reaches out and touches the coffin, which is dead. It's death. So law says the rules that are put in place says you can't touch me. And the rules that are put in place says you can't access me. But Jesus says, I'm going to reach out and touch you anyway. And that's what he does in our life. When we shut ourselves up, when we encage ourselves in, he reaches out beyond your rules, beyond your regulations, beyond the walls that we put up. And he says, no, there is something beautiful about to happen in your life. And he touches us. And he sets us free and he brings new life. Jesus was notorious for breaking down barriers and social constructs and things that were, uh, uh, that were not normal. He would always break through those things. And I want to encourage you, you may be establishing your own laws. You may be establishing your own boundaries and your own barriers, but Jesus can interrupt your life. And he will interrupt your life. You may have shielded yourself to God in your own closed environment, but there's this man named Jesus who will come in and tear down walls. He's not limited to your no. He's not limited to your walls. If he wants to do something in your life, he's going to do it, and he's going to interrupt you in such a way that brings new life in you. Not only are his interruptions intentional, his interruptions are intense. And we look at the definition of intense and it says of extreme force, a degree or strength, having or showing strong feelings or opinions, extremely earnest or serious. His interruptions are intense. Now look, he could have just sat there and watched this funeral procession go by. But he had the audacity to stop it because he understood the seriousness. He understood the intensity of what was happening. He understood the intensity of a woman losing everything. He understood the intensity and the seriousness of everything that was just falling apart in this, in this town, in this woman's life and among this family. He understood and he understands the seriousness of your condition today. So with extreme force, Jesus stops your procession. Because let's face it, we are all in a funeral procession on our way to our own eternal death. But Jesus interrupts and brings us life. Amen? The Bible tells us that for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. We are all on our procession to death. And he understands the seriousness of your eternity. And he understands the seriousness of your life and the reward and the gift of eternal life through him. So he interrupts our life. He knows the pain of your past. And he understands the uncertainty of your tomorrow. But he says, none of that matters. Your past is washed away and your future is written in my book and under my name. Amen. This is exciting news. This is good news. It's good. It's good news. Amen. His third, the third thing that happens is his interruptions are inspiring. We often think of interruptions as dismotivating or 
or annoying. We, we want to do our own thing and an interruption happens and, oh, really, I got to answer this phone call now? Oh, really, my kids want a snack? Dude, you're tall enough to get in the refrigerator. Go get a snack. We see them as dismotivating and annoying. And, but I want to encourage you today that a Jesus interruption is inspiring. The first thing that happens when this young man is raised from the dead is, is that he got up and he began to speak. I want to encourage you today, if God has done anything in your life, speak. If he has brought you any kind of new life, is, if he has brought you any kind of blessings in your life, open your mouth and speak. People need to see, people need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Open your mouth and speak. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Open your mouth and speak. An interruption by Jesus is inspiring and it motivates us to want to speak and tell the good news of Jesus Christ. And look, he can turn that interruption in your life into an invitation. Invite somebody to the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's three things that happen during a Jesus interruption and it's all in a collision of change. There's three changes that happen specifically during a Jesus interruption that we can glean from the scripture reference here. And the first is that there's a change of company. There is a change of crowd, a change of company in this story here. I want you to listen to me for a second. There were two crowds of, poli of people that collided that day. Remember, there was a sizable crowd that was in the funeral procession. There was this ginormous crowd that was following Jesus and witnessing the miracles that he had just done in Capernaum. And they were all motivated and excited. And they collided with this sizable crowd full of grief and sorrow. The crowd coming into the city had witnessed a wonderful healing, but the crowd going out of the city had witnessed a horrible death. The crowd coming into the city was excited. The crowd going out was devastated. The crowd coming in was happy, laughing, smiling. The crowd going out was sad, crying, and mourning. The crowd coming in was longing for the future. And the crowd going out was fearing the future. The one leading the crowd coming had huge potential. And the one leading the crowd going had no potential. The one leading the crowd coming had great power. But the one leading the crowd going had no power. There were two very different crowds that collided this day. I wonder which crowd we associate with best. Some of you may be trying and going to be positive and upbeat about life. And some of you are feeling as though you have had your heart ripped out of you. Which crowd are you in today? Two very different crowds collided that day. Our decisions and our priorities and our plans attract people. What we do, what we see, what we hear attracts people. So which crowd are you attracting today. I want to encourage you and I want to remind you that an interruption by Jesus is an amazing crowd control in your life. A huge crowd control. Have you ever seen in the news the riots? The, everything that's going on, the tear gas that's flying and you have all of these SWAT people, SWAT police and SWAT teams all up in a line and all these crowd control officers and riot teams standing in a line and they're controlling the crowd. And if we're not careful, the crowd that we bring into our life that crowds our life is like that, completely riotous and, and un, uh, uh, just going crazy in our life. But Jesus comes in and interrupts and he brings in crowd control in our life. And that's, that's amazing to know that he brings peace into our life. Two very different crowds. Which one are you a part of? There's also a change of conditions, a change 
in the environment. Again, Jesus touches the coffin. Jesus touches his environment that he's put himself in. Jesus touches the environment that you've put yourself in, and he changes it. He transforms it. It says uh, it, the environment we find ourselves in encages us and inhibits us, and it suffocates us. It steals our joy, destroys our vision, kills our passion. But he changes the environment around us, and he brings us to his secret place. We hide in our secret place, but when he begins to change the environment around us, he brings us to his secret place under the shadow of his wing, safe, protected, and peaceful. This is something amazing right here. He turns our environment into something beautiful. I looked up the definition of what the meaning of nine or nine, the, the name of the town was. Did you know nine, nine means beauty? Jesus came to this place where nothing was beautiful at the time. And he restored the beauty of it. And he can do that in your life. He makes something beautiful out of the chaos and out of the, the, the hell that you've made of life. He brings in and makes something beautiful in your life. And, and, I, and I love it because Romans, Romans uh, uh, where, is it, where am I at? Where am I at? Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for our good. For those who are called according to his purpose and those who love God. He makes everything work for our good. He makes everything beautiful. Amen. He brings life out of the ashes of our life. And lastly, there's a change of course. There's a change of destination. We are destined for hell. We are destined for death. But he changes from death to life in our life. His interruptions bring life to us. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 49 says, death is swallowed in victory. A few verses later says, where is your sting, O death? Where is your victory? It's been swallowed up in Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ. And now we have victory. We have life in him. He changes our course from death to life. If we would just stay on the way, we are all in this, we are all in this procession of life. And I am so glad that he interrupts us and he halts our procession. It says, don't cry. Don't weep. Little boy, little girl, I tell you to get up. Wake up. Would you stand with me as we close today? Jesus tells us he is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the Father. Nobody gets to heaven except through him. In John 3, 16, we probably all know it. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He brings life to them. Look, you are the dead person. I am the dead person. We are the spiritually dead person. There's nothing we can do to not be dead. We're dead. We are in the middle of being carried off to the gravesite. But this is where Jesus interrupts. This is where Jesus changes things. He interrupts our procession and he brings us back to life.